I should, I'm going to violate all principles of public speaking and apologize to start with because this is going to be a somewhat erratic presentation. The reason is that this is a large topic, uh, goes many ways, and the data out there is very erratic on itself. So anyway, my apologies, it's not going to flow as well as I would like. Uh, anyway, traumatic cardiac arrest, those people that die from trauma immediately. Now, we know that 75% of cardiac resuscitations are successful and the patient comes back and does well on television. Uh, and that, that quote, by the way, if you're interested, is from that major medical source, Wikipedia. Anyway, you know, for years, most of us sat there and thought that when you had a patient who had a traumatic cause of their heart stopping, not a, not a heart attack or any of those things, but a traumatic cause, that most of the things we did were futile. And I was one of the people who held that opinion for many years. Uh, what we're going to see today is that opinion may not be totally right, uh, but it still is probably fairly accurate, except in a very few circumstances. Okay, well the first thing we got to look at when we're going to look at traumatic arrest is why, do, why does the heart stop in trauma? Uh, <clears throat> and the first one actually sort of includes the first three. There isn't any blood flow to the heart and it becomes ischemic. And in, this, in the case of trauma, it's generally a general ischemia, not a localized ischemia like in a uh, MI. Uh, and as I say, the first three really sort of fall into that category, although I've kept them separate for uh, reasons that will become apparent. And then the fourth is mechanical damage to the heart, air embolism, and the usual pre-existing medical condition where the guy has his heart attack and it may be his heart attack was before the accident or he may have had the accident and immediately had a heart attack. But these are the major reasons that we can postulate that people die uh, or have a cardiac arrest from trauma. Well, this has been looked at and there's a lot of studies that are all statistics. I just pulled this one out because Number one, it's from Europe, and so it probably is a less biased toward penetrating trauma than we would see here. Uh, and this is the, what people died of when they had a cardiac arrest due to trauma. Now, the, we don't know when or where all of these things occur, as we'll see in a minute, but f almost 50% of them died of bleeding to death. So their heart stopped because somewhere down the line they died of bleeding to death. 13% died of attention pneumothorax, and that's one of the reasons I kept that as a separate category. 13% died of hypoxia. Again, that falls into that first category, global ischemia of the heart. 10% died of tamponade, and then the rest died of PEs, cortis, contusion cortis, and 12% they couldn't figure out why they died. Uh, as I said, a lot of this is, data is very unclear, uh, I mean, 75% of these died before they got to the hospital, which shouldn't be a big surprise to anybody. 6% uh, died in the emergency room. And this is, again, what you'd expect from a country that has a very well-developed, very robust trauma resuscitation system, that once, the, once you're gotten to and you get to the emergency room, you're probably going to do or have a better chance than you might some other places. 4% died in the OR and 16% died in the ICU, and I don't think this is much different than what we would see here or much other, many other places. Problem is that this is not broken down by what caused the cardiac arrest. It just says it's cardiac arrest, they died. Uh, I do think this is interesting, and again, it's why I kept tension pneumothorax out. Failure to decompress the tension pneumothorax was the single most common error in this study. Initial rhythms, and again, this shouldn't be any big surprise. PEA, uh, we've all been down there, we've all seen this. Asystole, once you have this, things are not going to go well, you think. And ventricular fibrillation, not that common in trauma. Uh, in the emergency room, those that survived in the emergency room, remember that only about 25% of the people that ultimately died made it to the emergency room to start with. About 60% had PEA, 14% had asystole, 20% uh, had a sinus rhythm, and 6% had ventricular fibrillation. Remember, again, that this is all people that die uh, of cardiac arrest, so it includes people that make it out of the emergency room. Well, okay, that's what the numbers show, and that probably is pretty much the same almost any place you 
can go where you have a robust trauma care system. So now I think we need to sort of look at what goes on when you have hypoxia in the heart. Uh, <clears throat> and the big thing that we all think about, the thing that was in the back of our minds when we felt that things were not really uh, useful in terms of resuscitation was the reperfusion injury. Uh, not really well understood. It's thought to be a combination of all of these things. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. First of all, I'll let me show you this cartoon. And the reason I'm showing this, because nobody's going to remember this, what it shows is multiple pathways going into this. And I think what you can take away from that is there is not going to be a magic bullet that you can just give somebody and reverse this. It's something that, you, that we're going to have to address in other mechanisms, with other mechanisms. Uh, reperfusion injury is most commonly described and most commonly studied in myocardial infarction. And remember, that's a localized area of ischemia versus what we see in trauma, which is generalized ischemia. So how well we can apply this to trauma is unclear, but this is where most of the studies come from. Reperfusion injury sort of divided into four types. Uh, you see them here, myocardial stunning, no reflow, reperfusion arrhythmia, and of course lethal reperfusion injury, the thing that has attracted our attention all these years. Type 1, myocardial stunning, this basically is just a heart muscle that's gotten ischemic, but not to the point of lethality and is recoverable. Type 2 is no reflow, and this is kind of an interesting uh, phenomena. It's seen after angioplasty, uh, and it occurs at two levels, the arterial level, which is basically a microemboli level, and the capillary level, which we'll see here, actually consists of a lot of things, but the long and the short of it is, is that flow in the capillary bed is disrupted. Now, why is this important in trauma? And I think this is the reason. Uh, in studies in animals, uh, where you can block or cause a local injury by blocking a vessel and you get this microemboli and you get this uh, capillary response, what can happen is if you repeatedly block it, unblock it, block it, and unblock it, you can actually condition the heart to do better. These are the reasons that are thought to be behind this down here, but I think what this suggests is that maybe there is something mechanical or something chemical we can do uh, to activate these same things in this circumstance. I don't know. Reperfusion arrhythmia, this shouldn't, I mean, this is an arrhythmia, shouldn't be a big surprise to anybody, nothing really to say about that. We deal with these all the time. And finally, lethal reperfusion injury, the thing that has always been on our mind when we see cardiac uh, stoppage, when we see asystole, when we see something going on, when we see the patient that comes into the emergency room, we resuscitate him and then he dies three hours later. Uh, these seem to be the mechanisms behind this. The final mechanism, uh, mitochondrial permeability, uh, and this probably is the major underlying issue here. Uh, these are pores that open uh, in response to the calcium influx coming in uh, and change of pH. In other words, what we're doing is we're putting the cells back in their normal milieu and they don't respond to it because all of a sudden things that normally would be at balance on one side of the membrane or the other aren't and the cell dies. So what can we do about this? Like I said, there's no magic bullets. And the first thing is CPR. Now what about CPR and trauma? Again, we've all seen the TV shows, you know, the good guy gets shot on the street and his partner rushes up to him and puts his hand over his chest, there stops his bleeding, right? Uh, puts his hand over his chest and then starts to pump on the chest and he's back with his family next week. Uh, and we all know this probably doesn't happen very much. But does it happen at all? Well, they looked at this. Uh, in England in uh, 2004, studied 909 patients who had pre-hospital CPR secondary to trauma. Now whenever you see this CPR secondary to trauma, you have to realize that you don't really know what's going on. Uh, did they get CPR because somebody thought they needed CPR? Did they really have a heart stoppage? We'll look at some of the statistics in a minute, but you have to hold that in the back of your mind. Anyway, 131 survived to discharge from the ED, 68 survived to hospital discharge, and these are the causes 
of or what was going on in the patients that survived. Six had a head injury. Well, why did their heart stop? I don't know. Uh, six had cervical spine injuries. But we get down here, and these are the interesting things. One had an on-scene thoracotomy following blunt trauma. Most of us would have said this would be totally worthless. But nevertheless, they had one survivor with that and one survivor that they opened the chest in uh, or did CPR and with hypovolemic arrest from a penetrating injury. Okay. Anyway, overall, 13% of these survivors, if you followed what I would have normally done, 13 of these survivors would not have been resuscitated and obviously not survived. So I think that in itself sort of pushes us to think, is this the way we want to go? Uh, do we need to sort of rethink this? Now the Germans have studied, Germans study everything, the Germans have studied this. Uh, this is from two separate trauma registries and they're two separate populations. Unfortunately, you can't really meld this data. Registry number one is 368 patients who received CPR pre-hospital. Now what caused that CPR? Again, I don't know. I can tell you in my experience the Germans are pretty uh, matter of fact about what they do. I mean, uh, the, there probably was a good reason for these people all getting CPR. The second group were patients that arrived at the hospital with spontaneous circulation, but then got CPR again. The reasons are not mentioned. And these are two separate populations, two separate studies in two separate parts of Germany, although they were, they were uh, from the same journal article. Now in the registry number one, remember these are people that arrested before the hospital and had CPR. 29% had spontaneous return of circulation and 26% made it to the, made it the hospital. I don't have any data on what happened to them after that. So again, uh, who knows what this means. Registry number two, these are people that made it to the hospital but then lost vital signs. 13% survived 24 hours. And now we're looking at how they, how they did. 7% were actually discharged alive and 2% actually went home and had good outcomes. Not good. Spanish studied this. 167 patients with traumatic cardiac arrest from 2006-2009. They all got advanced life support. Uh, and here are the initial rhythms in all of them. And this shouldn't be a big surprise anyway. 67% uh, uh, had a systole, and of those, 40% actually got their circulation back. 26% uh, had PEA. Of these, 60% got their circulation back. Again, this shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, to anybody that's worked with this. And I, I mean, I think the surprise, if anything, is the 40% in the asystole, and 6% had VFib with, you know, really excellent return of circulation. Again, shouldn't be a surprise. Overall, in this study, 49%, oh, 50% uh, got return of circulation. However, 6.6% ended up having a complete neurologic recovery of those. Uh, of the whole population, 23% of those that uh, did okay, or of the total population, were children. Five were adult, and three were elderly. And again, this shouldn't be any surprise to anybody. Now, the other point here that's interesting is 9.4% survived if they had, if the advanced ambulance, that is the ambulance that's capable of doing all of the resuscitation got there first. Only 3% <laughs> survived if the basic guys got there and just started CPR. Overall though, if more than 10 minutes passed, and this is 10 minutes from the event, not 10 minutes from cardiac arrest. Uh, overall, if more than 10 minutes passed, nobody survived. Now obviously Madrid, this is Madrid, Spain, they have good EMS system. Uh, so we don't know when the cardiac arrest occurred in these patients. We don't know whether it occurred immediately before the arrival of EMS. All we know is that more than 10 minutes from the time that they left to the time they got there and found the patient in cardiac arrest occurred, nobody survived. Other, other countries have looked at this. France, 25% uh, had return to circulation. 4% left were alive at 24 hours and less than 1% left the hospital. Australia, again, we're all, this is all ALS after trauma. Uh, patients were given CPR at EMT discretion, so already you have a bias here. And they only, even with its bias, they, 
or they, with this bias, I should say, they had 4.5% survival. So this sort of suggests what we thought all along. Problem is uh, that these, these statistics aren't really interchangeable. You have to look at each one of these and you go, what are they really saying? Uh, anyway. Study from the National Trauma Data Bank in 2014, and this was in kids, uh, and it also, of course, has all the problems associated with the, tra with the National Trauma Data Bank, including uh, the garbage in, garbage out uh, aspect of it's only as reliable as how reliable the person to put the data in is. Anyway, they had 7,766 patients, 18 and younger. Uh, here's the age distribution, and surprise, surprise, most of these were teenagers the age that nature intended to cleanse the gene pool by 50%. Uh, but anyway, 50% of them were teenagers. When they looked at this, 25% resuscitated in the field by EMS, and 14% uh, of those made it to discharge. 4% uh, over overall survival to discharge. 6.4 had a thoracotomy within 24 hours. Of these, 1% survived to discharge. The interesting thing is, uh, this was all pediatrics, but the age distribution had nothing to do with it. Your chances were the same if you were uh, two to two years old as if you were 14 years old. Well, what other things can we do about it? Enough, enough statistics about who lives, who dies, and who seems to respond. What else can we look at? Well, there's always the magic bullet. And the first thing to look at is vasopressin because this has been studied. This has been studied in trauma because it's thought to be superior to epinephrine uh, when the patient is acidotic, which describes most trauma uh, arrests. Uh, <clears throat> it shifts blood from the muscle fat and the GI tract, uh, and it supposedly decreases uh, nitric oxide uh, mediated vasodilatation. In other words, it takes a lack of blood and at least improves the flow to the uh, important organs, including the heart. Now, <clears throat> has this really been studied? And the answer is, eh, not really. I mean, this is a case report where they had a, brought a guy back that they shouldn't have brought back. This is like level 12 evidence. Uh, brought him back, and then he lost him in the OR from another cause. But they brought the guy back, and he survived to go to the OR, and he survived induction of anesthesia. Has been studied in animals. Uh, this is a rather interesting animal model. Uh, what they did was they anesthetized pigs, obviously, and put them on mechanical ventilation and stabilized them for three hours. And then they shot little different labeled microspheres in so that at the time of necropsy, they could tell how much blood flow was present at each organ at the capillary bed level uh, at each time during the resuscitation. They then induced shock by putting the patient in hypovolemic shock, 35% of blood volume, which is not profound shock, uh, it's grade three shock. And they did this over 15 minutes. And then they fibrillated them, which sort of, now you're sort of wandering into, huh? Uh, what's this got to do with it? They did CPR for six and a half minutes and then defibrillated them. And then they, uh, they tested them all with vasopressin, epinephrine, or saline afterwards. Uh, and what they found was rather interesting. Uh, in all of these, coronary perfusion was equal at 90 seconds. At five minutes, epinephrine produced increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, and adrenal flow. Vasopressin increased renal flow. Epinephrine produced more acidosis, vasopressin less. And at 55 minutes, uh, there was 100% mortality in the epinephrine-treated animals, 0% in vasopressin-treated. Uh, but then they all had 100% mortality when they euthanized them, so we don't know what happened after that. <laughs> and and I, I mean, the thing to remember is that when we're dealing with these patients in the emergency room and you get one of these people back, the time that they die, and they die of uh, basically myocard they die of myocardial cell death, is usually four or five hours. It's not immediately after you resuscitate them. So again, this study does lack something. But this is what they concluded. Uh, they concluded the treatment of hypovolemic arrest with vasopressin, but not epinephrine or saline, resulted in sustained vital organ perfusion, less acidosis, and improved survival. Uh, 
and additionally, one of the side of things they found was the CPR actually produced higher coronary perfusion pressures than expected. This was actually studied in real people in San Antonio in 2011, double-blinded three trauma uh, center study. Uh, inclusion uh, requirements are there, uh, and that, along with the exclusion. They were enrolled within six hours, got a bolus of vasopressin followed by a drip or same volume normal sailing with one hour, within one hour of being hypotensive and it was continued for five hours. Now how they got away with this, I don't know, but they, they did. 78 patients, 38 got vasopressin, 40 got controlled. There was no significant demographic difference. However, uh, the abdominal AIS score was greater in the control group and the penetrating injury was greater in control group. Nevertheless, the control group got more blood, which is not a surprise. Uh, mortality after 24 hours was 23% in control group versus 13% in vasopressin. Remember, I'm not sure they were looking at two similar populations here. 30-day mortality was 28% in the vasopressin, 18% in the control. So what does this mean? Uh, Multi-organ failure was higher in vasopressin, partially because the death rate was high, initial death rate was higher in the controls, and, but this was considered not to be statistically significant. And the end point of this, and I'm sure this is why this was published in the World Journal of Surgery, not where you go to look for trauma statistics, uh, was there was possibly an early survival advantage. And I include this very iffy study uh, mainly because people are going to quote it. Okay. Now how about another drug, amiodarone? Very similar model, the same thing, shock the animal, uh, put them in fibrillation, give drugs. In this case they're also using vasopressin, uh, defibrillated, uh, then kept at systolic of 70 or above with dobutamine and returning shed blood. What did they find? Well, interesting enough, those that got amiodarone on this Kaplan-Meier curve actually had a higher survival. What does this mean? I don't know. But uh, it's there for you to think about. Well, what about mechanical injury of the heart? And these are the things that can happen to the heart in trauma, both blunt and penetrating. You can have myocardial contusion, basically a bruise in the heart. You can have a capillary muscle rupture. You can have valvular rupture. You can have a hole in the wall or septum, or you can have a big hole. Uh, and these are all things, unless somebody can think of something else, uh, I mean, I suppose you could think of things like transection of the coronary arteries or things, but these are the major reason that somebody is going to have a cardiac arrest from mechanical injury to the heart. Surgery. Well, it's first done uh, successfully in 1897 stab wound of the heart. This was four days after the injury. So, obviously, but he did successfully uh, salvage a patient. Uh, studied predominantly up to that, or after that, for gunshot wounds. And prior to World War II, uh, treatment, and obviously this is for tamponade only, was repeated thoracentesis or aspiration. And there's many good studies showing that this was successful. Uh, you have to remember that in World War II, oftentimes uh, it took 18 hours to get to definitive care. Uh, so you pre-selected out a population that had a chance of survival. But nevertheless, they, a lot of these patients did survive uh, and survive long term with pericardiocentesis uh, that was repeated each time they had a recollection of their tamponade. Uh, and this became the standard, was the standard of care, it was Army dogma in World War II, Army dogma in Korea, and became the dogma in the trauma, pop, or trauma community post-Korea by basically the surgeons returning from the Korean War. Thoracotomy was reserved for uncontrolled bleeding uh, and these other mechanical issues you see here, all of which you're going to find usually later on. Okay, well this they started looking at this in the early, seven, early 60s, and in a, in a Sentinel paper from Louisville, uh, 75 single gunshot wounds to the chest were described. Uh, they were all taken to the operating room for resuscitation, uh, and this is what they did. 21 ended up with a thoracentesis, 9 had a thoracentesis plus a chest tube, 10 had a chest tube, 
by itself. 23 had an immediate thoracotomy, six delayed thoracotomies, and six had wound care only. Uh, of this group, 16 survived uh, of the immediate thoracotomy group. Uh, the people that everybody would have said didn't have a chance. Uh, death was usually from bleeding from major pulmonary vessels, which we all know is very difficult to deal with on a controlled basis, let alone an emergent basis. The complication rate was 43% uh, and was actually lower than any of the other groups, although these people were more seriously injured. And the, what they came out of this, they recommended that maybe early thoracotomy should be thought about rather than a late delayed thoracotomy, as was the case in World War II Korea. So now we got to talk about what everybody thought I was going to talk about the whole time, right? And that's the emergency thoracotomy. Uh, this is defined as a thoracotomy in the field, in the emergency room, or in the operating room. Not just the, emo the emergency room, okay? And you have to remember this when you look at all these statistics. This is what we think we can do. There are things that have been proposed as things you can do during a uh, emergency thoracotomy. You can evacuate the pericardium. Uh, relieving a tamponade. You can directly control exsanguinating interthoracic hemorrhage, good luck. Uh, you can do open cardiac massage, which uh, has been shown to be more effective than closed cardiac massage, although I'm not sure opening the chest, is, the trade-off is worth it. You can cross-clamp the descending aorta. This has been described. To, the, theoretically, you're going to slow blood loss below the diaphragm and increase perfusion to the brain and the heart. Or you can cross-clamp the pulmonary hilum uh, to mitigate air embolism. Okay, uh, we will see what each of these really accomplishes. This study from Norway, and I just pulled this silly little study uh, because these people had 30% penetrating injuries. Penetrating injuries are very rare in Europe. Uh, in, fact, in fact, when I was asked to speak in England, they, they decided to not have me speak on ballistics because we just never see it. Uh, but anyway, uh, of this study, in the study, five emergency thoracotomies were done. Remember the definition, although uh, in this case it was ED or OR. Five were in the ED, five were in the OR, and nobody survived. Okay. They recommended uh, only for penetrating trauma, signs of life, organized EKG activity, reactive pupils. That's what the signs of life means, basically, when you look at these things and it was recommended that not be done for blunt trauma. Okay, this is the ATLS, this is the newest ATLS, uh, ninth edition. And this is specifically what it says, patients with penetrating thoracic injury arriving with PEA, you can, you can talk about uh, doing a thoracotomy. You can talk about it when a surgeon with appropriate, you have to have a surgeon with appropriate skills, I should say. and. It's not indicated in blunt trauma. This is dogma from the American College of Surgeons. Again, remember, dogma's dogma uh, isn't necessarily 100% true, but this is what the American College of Surgeons says. Well, this has been studied. Uh, I went back when I started to research this, and I went back to ATLS and pulled their list of publications to see how they came up with this uh, uh, recommendation. And what they had done is they had a panel, always, always worrisome, but they had a panel, uh, reviewed four, 548 publications, uh, of which 24 met the criteria that they were looking for. Uh, these were all emergency department thoracotomies, uh, included both blunt and penetrating uh, reported, and basically was 4,500 patients. Overall survival was 7.4%. 8.8% .8 of these were penetrating, 16% of the whole group were stab wounds, 4% were gunshot wounds. Only 1.4% of the survivors survived because of blunt injuries. And again, we don't, all of this is data that's being reported. We don't really know a lot of the information about these things. 10% uh, of the survivors uh, had thoracic injuries, cardiac, i.e. probably tamponade, 20% almost. Uh, abdomen, 4.5% of, of people survived. And multiple injuries, only less than 1% survived in lo looking at this uh, data collection. Uh, looking at it this way, signs of life on arrival, you survive. 
almost 12% survival. No signs of life on arrival, 2.5%. That's still 2.5%. Signs of life during transport, 8.9% uh, had survival. No signs of life in the field survival is 1%. Uh, again, we don't know anything about length of transport, time without signs of life, time of uh, abdominal injury, uh, or what else was done in all of these studies. This is simply looking at, th at thoracotomies. The good news out of this, when you did survive, 92.4% had normal neurologic function. Okay. Well, this Denver looked at this uh, in 2004, 26-year study. Uh, 9,000, almost 9, 960 emergency department thor thoracotomies. They had 62 survivors. All were intubated in the field. 63% were stab wounds, 19% were gunshot wounds, 18% were blunt. 26% or 26 had pre-hospital CPR, all with CPR for less than 15 minutes. Uh, four were blunt and two presented in V-fib. Remember, V-fib usually had a better prognosis. They had a poor, all of these, however, had a poor neurologic recovery. Four gunshots, two with V-fib, 18 stabs, 11 with tamponade, and six presented in asystole, all had tamponade. And this actually was the best group to be in uh, if you look at their final statistics. We don't know what they did in the thoracotomy. You know, did they open the, open the chest and go, oh, there's nothing I can do and move on and do something else and have a survival, survivor, or did they uh, do, actually do something? We don't know. Uh, except for the asystole with tamponade, which were all sad stab wounds, all patients that survived had a rhythm when they made it to the hospital. And again, no mention is made of what prompted the thoracotomy in the 36 survivors who didn't have CPR. So we don't know. Uh, those of us that remember reading the literature in the 80s, remember there was a certain hospital in California that had, while the rest of us were having like one and two percent survivors from emergency room to, uh, thoracotomies, had like 15 percent survivors. And we all thought that a lot of those were survival despite the surgeon, not because of him. Anyway, what they recommended at this study was that you do not do a thoracotomy if blunt trauma CPR is greater than five minutes. Where this comes from, I don't know. You know, I mean, it doesn't fit their data, but this is what they recommended, uh, had no si and had no signs of life. Uh, penetrating injury, CPR more than 15 minutes, and no signs of life. Again, very loose uh, extraction from their data. Uh, or penetrating in trauma and asystole with no possibility of tamponade. Well, we're going to talk about something a little more interesting now. That was all basically early thoracotomies, but most of it involved emergency department of thoracotomies. In London, there is a group doing pre-hospital thoracotomies. We'll talk more about this in a minute. Uh, they reported this data in 2001. Uh, in results, they had 39 patients between 1993 and 1999, which is when they started doing it. They had four survivors. Well, you know, that's, that's not bad. That's 10%. And three had a good result. And this is what, you, what they reported at this time. And I think the important thing to look at is this, the anatomic injuries. A single cardiac injury, they had nine, 44% survived. All the rest of these, nobody survived. Okay. Well, they looked at their, that was 2001. They looked at their data again in 2010. Uh, this was now a 15 year review of pre-hospital thoracotomy. 71 patients, 13 survived. Again, now, we're, I mean, we're talking, you know, 16, 17%. That's pretty good. This is what, what they did to get that. They had a trained practitioner available for 24-hour call for immediate dispatch. They can do this in Europe. They went out to the scene. These people were trained in thoracotomy. They did the thoracotomy if the right criteria met, and only if the right criteria were met. Had to be a penetrating injury, there had to be a cardiac arrest that was less than 10 minutes prior to arrival, and it had to be more than five minutes to take them to a facility. Otherwise, if they were close to a, a medical facility that could do, they took, they transported them rather than doing on the scene thoracotomy. And again, this is what they uh, found. 
when they looked at their data. And I mean, this is, in attendance means that basically the cardiac arrest occurred after the team got there. But anyway, uh, I mean, look at this. I mean, neurologic outcomes, good, poor, good, 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 impaired, poor, good, 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 good. I mean, this is pretty impressive, I think. Uh, one further little thing, pericardiostentesis. I mention this because this has sort of fallen out of favor. Uh, Australian who writes fairly frequently in the trauma literature has described a pericardiostentesis as a needle with a clot at both ends. However, uh, which isn't always what we find. However, they looked at this in Denver. Denver seems to see, do a lot of this stuff. They looked at 78 patients with penetrating cardiac injury who survived to go to the OR. And in Denver, you had to have a systolic of 70 to get, make it to the OR. Otherwise, you stayed in the emergency room. Uh, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But that was their requirement. 39 underwent ED thoracotomy, had 57% survival, not bad. 22 went directly to the OR. Now, 17 underwent pericardiostentesis to tap the tamponade uh, and drain between 15 to 200 mLs. We're assuming these actually were pericardiostentesis, by the way. Uh, in 10, hypotension improved. Mortality was 12% versus 30% in patients with positive ultrasound who went directly to the OR. This is not a surprise, because these are the people, remember, that have a, have a systolic of less than 70. Both patients, or both groups, had similar heart rate, blood pressure, and time to the OR. Uh, but the thing that came out of that was that there was no difference in the time it took them to get them to the OR or outcome from people that had pericardiostentesis versus people that didn't. Well, so let's round all of this up. What are the recommendations? Well, this is what the Western Trauma Association, everybody loves algorithms, right? This is uh, what the Western Trauma, so Western Trauma Association recommends. A uh, patient undergoing CPR with no signs of life and profound refractory shock, they get a recessive thoraco resuscitative thoracotomy. Uh, if, or if they're not in profound shock, just undergoing CPR. Blunt trauma, CPR less than 10 minutes. Penetrating CPR less than 15 minutes. This is basically, obviously, the Denver recommendations. Uh, no, they're dead. Yes, they get a resuscitative thoracotomy, and then you go down here. And this is basically not a whole lot different than what we've just talked about. This is the Germans, what the Germans want to do. Uh, again, in reality, I mean, it looks different. It really doesn't say a whole lot. Uh, penetrating injury in the area of potential tamponade, bilateral chest drains, CPR, PEA, exclude hypoxia, exclude tension pneumothorax. Remember in the German study, the tension pneumothorax really was responsible for, what was it, 18% of uh, deaths was the most common reason for somebody to die uh, when it wasn't recognized. Anyway, uh, this is all of the uh, things the Germans do up until the time uh, where you don't have returns of life and do pericardiostentesis. Uh, and no return of life, basically nothing happens. This is the London, and I think this is the interesting one. This is the London uh, algorithm. Uh, penetrating injury, these are for the folks that get pre-hospital thoracotomies. Penetrating injury, pulse present, yes, they go to the hospital, no, you intubate them. Uh, nearest surgical intervention, less than 10 minutes from loss of pulse. Uh, if it is, they get transport. Uh, if it isn't, if it's greater than 10 minutes, then they get the scene thoracotomy. And remember, they actually had quite good survivals from this. Uh, obviously, it requires a lot of uh, commitment in terms of resources and in terms of personnel, but they did have good survivals. So, in conclusion, what can we say about this? Well, first of all, unlike I used to think, CPR probably isn't futile or may not be futile if started within 10 minutes of the arrest. Uh, and remember, that came from a study where we really didn't know when the arrest occurred. It was the 10 minutes really was 10 minutes from the time of the accident to arrival of EMS and determination that there was an arrest. But it may not be futile. Uh, in the field, thoracotomy or ED thoracotomy should be limited to penetrating injuries. I still believe this, who are witness to lose signs of life. Uh, either on, 
as they are about to cross the door uh, into the emergency room or in the emergency bay. Uh, fluid resuscitation, and this means blood, is crucial. Uh, and if you went back and looked at all of those studies, I mean, they didn't talk it, but they would talk about that because they were all interested in other things. But that was always in the background, the patients getting blood resuscitation. And vasopressin may be, maybe, maybe, the presser of choice. But the most important thing is the faster you get to them, the better chance they have. Okay, any questions on all of that? Because I probably don't know. survival rate uh, was surprisingly good considering they were getting an operation that was unnecessary potentially um, and maybe potentially there were a few patients that they got there uh, so early that they preempted them from having a cardiac arrest it's hard to know but, but certainly those data shouldn't be mixed in the challenge with a lot of these studies is everybody's definition of what a blunt arrest is, is quite different. For some people, it's a blood pressure less than a certain number. For other people, it may be that they don't palpate peripheral pulses. Um, and so you have to read beyond the abstract. Don't stop at the abstract. Our own personal review was roughly 17,000 trauma patients. We, had, we did ED thoracotomies or ER thoracotomies <coughs> in a little over 600, almost 700 patients. And of uh, that, we found basically the same thing. Penetrating trauma, we had a reasonable chance at survival if there was a witness to rest. And in blunt trauma, we essentially had no survivors um, with meaningful survival. And then the, the point that we identified as being a, a, a turning point out of that study was if they have a pulse that's less than 40, um, that was another prognostic factor in that group of um, six or 700 ER thoracotomies where we had no survivors. So if they, the patient doesn't have normal sinus rhythm on an EKG, the chances you're going to get them back are essentially zero. And we did sort of brush on all that, that all of these, none of these studies can be taken, they all have to be taken individually. None of them really say the same thing. None of them really look at the same thing. Uh, and, and you have to ask yourself, and we did that on one of those early slides, what can I do when I go into the chest? And <clears throat> that those uh, potential maneuvers were listed, and the only one that is really practically successful. I mean, sometimes they talk about stopping hemorrhage easier said than done. Uh, but the only thing that really is long-term successful is the uh, release of the tamponade. Uh, once in a while, I suppose you're gonna have somebody that you can, uh, that's bleeding from something and you can actually torse the lung. I didn't talk about that, but that's one of the things that can be done. The lung can be taken freed up of all its attachments and twisted on itself is faster and easier than a uh, clamp across the hilum. Uh, again. You've got exposure, just the big vascular clamp, slide yeah. it down from above. Yeah. The problem with torsing is you have to take the intrapulmonary ligament and yeah. Yeah. Right yeah, it there. depends on what you can do but, easiest. But, uh, but again, the, I, I think the take home, especially for the residents, is the hard thing to do when you're training is to quit because you don't want 
to have on your conscience somebody dying that you feel like if there was somebody more experienced there, they would have survived. So I'd never fault a resident for trying, uh, and then I may get there and say, okay, that's it, we're done, we're finished. Um, and it takes a fair number of years before you get to where you feel, you know, I'm ready to make the decision that there is no possibility that this person's gonna survive, even if there's a twitch in the heart or even if there's, you know, maybe something that you can see. And again, these studies point out that even something as well-defined as death, uh, there's not agreement on a definition. Uh, so you have to deal with the, the, the patient on an individual basis. When in doubt, I have no problems with people giving, a, giving it a shot. And within that, when in doubt, for penetrating, find reasons to open. For blunt, find reasons to quit. And I think that will probably keep you out of trouble. Questions?